with the American Indian and other indigenous communities to rethink community-based mental health services and to harness traditional culture and spirituality for advancing indigenous well-being. He's an enrolled member of the Ani Grovan Tribal Nation of Montana, and among many other roles, is director of the Harvard University Native American Program and an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. So with that, I'll hand this over to Dr. Gunn. Thanks, Scott. I so appreciate your welcoming us. Uh, as the director of our uh, colloquium series, it's really nice to, um, to have you um, do that. So I, I'm, I'm really grateful. And I'm especially grateful, of course, to be featuring our invited guest today. So um, before I introduce Dr. Bombay, though, let me um, speak as faculty director of the Harvard University Native American Program to convey to you that we have collaborated with the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog over these past years to develop an acknowledgement of land and people um, with their permission. And so um, let me say that Harvard University is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the orig original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe past and present and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. So as those of you who've been following us know, we've been having this indigenous health and well-being uh, colloquium series for coming up on um, almost two years soon. And um, this happened at a time when the pandemic struck and we went virtual and that's been a big blessing in disguise because it enables us to really circulate this opportunity well beyond our department, of course, which is a super important constituency. We're so grateful to all of our colleagues and students who come to this, but it's also the case that we could reach folks out in indigenous communities who are engaged in behavioral health and other kinds of uh, endeavors to uh, advance indigenous well-being. And so um, it was wonderful to be able to uh, invite Dr. Bombay, who is doing the super important work, uh, empirical work on indigenous historical trauma. And I was expecting there would be a large crowd, which, which there is today. So let me go ahead and introduce Professor Bombay, Amy Bombay, Anishinaabe from Rainy Rivers River First Nations is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and the School of Nursing at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada. She has co-led and been involved in various quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods projects in collaboration with Indigenous organizations assessing various topics related to well-being among Indigenous peoples. Her primary areas of inquiry have focused on exploring the relationships between historical trauma, contemporary stressor exposure, cultural identity, and health and social outcomes among First Nations people in Canada. One of her main programs of research has explored the different pathways by which stress and trauma experienced in Indian residential schools and the child welfare system can be transmitted across generations, which has garnered extensive media interest and has influenced policy and practice related to the well-being of Indigenous peoples. Now, Professor Bombay is going to talk to us today about intergenerational transmission of trauma and resilience in First Nations peoples. And so first we'll hear from Professor Bombay for a while, and then um, you can post questions you might have for her in the Q&A uh, portion of this Zoom seminar, and I will help to curate those once we move into our discussion period. Um, so Dr. Bombay, this, the floor is yours, take it away. Thank you so much, and thank you. I'm really appreciative of the invitation and to be here. And I guess I'll just jump right in and share my screen. All right. Okay, I guess I'll just start by, uh, I'm at Dalhousie University, as Dr. Gahn said, uh, which is located uh, in Halifax in the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And just to give you an outline of what I'll be covering today, um, I'll just spend a very short amount of time giving some background and context uh, of, of Indigenous peoples in Canada, uh, with most of, most of my research focusing on First Nations. Um, then I'll, most of the, the talk will be about uh, our research assessing the links between different aspects of colonialism uh, and, and health and social outcomes. And specifically, um, most of that research is looking at the direct and intergenerational effects of Indian residential schools, as well as looking at uh, what are the pathways involved in those intergenerational effects across generations. And then some of our more recent work has been looking at the links between different historical and collective trauma. Specifically, uh, we're looking at how residential schools uh, are linked with subsequent uh, familial involvement with the child welfare system. 
And then we'll talk about some of our research that ha is assessing how different aspects of culture and cultural identity are linked with health and social outcomes. And I'll finish with just a little bit of uh, discussion about um, how we've been using our research uh, to support First Nations well-being. And I'd just like to note um, that, you know, it can be distressing to think about past and ongoing stress and trauma and how has it affected you, your family and community. Uh, I know I can unexpectedly get emotional even after doing this for, for many years. Um, my own family has been affected by the Indian residential school system and the child welfare system. So I encourage you to, um, if you need to, just turn me off and, and take the time you need. Uh, and, and that's totally okay. So um, to start with just a little bit of background, uh, in Canada, there are three main Indigenous groups, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, um, all three groups of which are very diverse within those, within those uh, groups. Um, among First Nations, which is the largest group representing uh, just over half of Indigenous people in Canada, um, there are over 600 different communities representing 50 nations and languages. And so most of my research, as I said, will be um, focused on First Nations, and I'll point out um, what specific groups I'll be talking about um, when I present that research. Um, so to give you uh, a little background um, of, the, of, of the context in Canada, like other countries with similar colonial backgrounds, uh, Indigenous people in Canada face health and social gaps relative to the non-Indigenous population. And um, this really came to light in Canada kind of more, more widely uh, when the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples released their uh, final report in 1996. And it was at that time that uh, that report also raised some awareness and brought to light some, the long-term and negative effects of various aspects of colonialism, including the Indian residential school system. It also highlighted the importance of culture-based healing practices for indigenous peoples, for their wellness, um, and for, for healing from these um, aspects of colonialism. And it was concluded within this report that tinkering with existing programs and services would not be enough to foster substantial improvements in the health of Indigenous peoples and called for new and innovative approaches. Um, unfortunately, many of our CAPS recommendations were not implemented. And unfortunately, today, um, as, as noted in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada final report, uh, and that commission was focused specifically on um, looking at the Indian residential school system. Um, you know, it outlines the continued health and social gaps in Canada and the intergenerational effects of colonialism. Um, and, and also the continued harmful policies um, that perpetuate the intergenerational cycles of, uh, of residential schools, such as the underfunding of health and social services on reserve, which I'll come back to in a little bit. And um, in the TRC final report, they had many of the same calls to action as RCAP did, you know, 20 years earlier. And so um, I don't have time to, you know, give a full history of colonialism in Canada. Um, but again, similar to the US uh, and Australia, New Zealand, um, and some other countries. Um, indigenous people in Canada were viewed as the Indian problem and and so once Canada was, was formed, it was a lot of the goals of the government to get rid of this problem through um, various policies aimed at assimilation, um, including laws prohibiting cultural practices and ceremonies. And what a lot of our research uh, is looking at is those policies that were targeting specifically the assimilation of, of children, um, which started with the Indian residential school system. And uh, in some of the historical writings, it was noted that the government deemed children most suitable for complete transformation. And, it, and that was the reasoning uh, behind Indian residential schools, which had the explicit goal of assimilation. And following the Indian residential school system, as that was shut down, um, what followed was the 60s scoop, which is in the 60s, um, instead of the Indian residential schools take, forcing children to leave their homes, it was the child welfare system. And unfortunately, that continues today in the high rates of 
uh, Indigenous children. And we'll, I'll come back to, to that uh, later on in the, in the talk. So first to start with um, Indian residential schools in Canada, to give you a bit of history, um, they ran from the mid 1800s into, into, until 1996. So over several generations where indigenous children across Canada were forced to attend um, and, and parents were threatened with imprisonment and other punishment if they tried to keep their children at home. And as I mentioned, the explicit, explicit goal was assimilation. And you know, the famous kind of quote was uh, that these were to take the Indian out of the child. And as far as residential school experiences of those who's attended, um, they were all separated from their families, communities, and cultures for long periods of time. Um, uh, in some of uh, the, the, the historical records, we see the children as young as three attending residential school. And, many and there they face widespread neglect and many face different types of abuse. And it's been estimated that over 6,000 uh, children died while going to these schools. And also, you know, considering the explicit, explicit goal of assimilation, children were denied their cultural, uh, their cultures and were exposed to explicit cultural shaming as well. So based on research in other populations, um, we would expect that residential school survivors who faced uh, chronic uh, levels of um, different types of adverse childhood experiences, abuse, neglect, um, we would expect that they would be, fa be facing uh, negative health and social outcomes as adults based on research in other populations. And just to give you an example, this is uh, the adverse childhood experience study done in the US was one of the first um, studies to really uh, explore how adverse childhood experiences is linked with different types of health and social outcomes. And so this study uh, assessed various types of childhood abuse, neglect and household dysfunction and have carried out a number of uh, studies and analyses um, looking at how uh, the number of childhood adversities that a person is exposed to is associated with all sorts of different types of negative health and social outcomes. Um, this particular graph I have on the right shows um, the study showing that the, the greater number of the childhood uh, adverse experiences that they're exposed to, which is that ACE score, uh, is associated with uh, graded relationships uh, with mean number of comorbid health outcomes. So the more childhood adversity you're exposed to, the, the more health problems you're going to face in adulthood. And uh, this is in fact what we find when we look at the health of uh, those who attended residential schools, that survivors are more likely to suffer various negative health outcomes. And what our research has really focused a lot on is looking at how um, those experiences of those who attended actually have health and social effects uh, in the children and grandchildren of those who attended. So this, this graph here is just one example uh, of, of some of the intergenerational and direct effects we've looked at. And uh, this particular graph and a lot of the findings I'll pre be presenting throughout the presentation is from the First Nations Regional Health Survey, which is a population-based uh, survey collected in First Nations communities. So it is only looking at First Nations uh, living on reserve in Canada and doesn't consider those living off reserve. But uh, we do do some research uh, off reserve and we see all of the same effects. Um, and this, just to note this, uh, this survey is run by the First Nations Information Governance Center um, who is a First Nations organization and they run this survey and, and work with Indigenous uh, First Nations communities across Canada to collect this data for First Nations. So moving on to the graph, um, we see uh, this is looking at the proportion of adults who've reported moderate or high psychological distress. And this is from the 2008 and 10 survey. And so we can see um, that we look at this red bar, this is represents those uh, First Nations peoples living on reserve who did not attend residential school themselves and who did not have a parent or grandparent who attended. And we can see when we look at residential school survivors, they are uh, more likely to report um, high levels of psychological distress 
and as are those who did not attend residential school themselves, but who had at least one parent who attended, and as are those who uh, had at least one grandparent who attended. And so we actually see similar levels of distress um, in the children and grandchildren compared to those who attended, really speaking to the strength of these intergenerational effects across, uh, across generations. And I'll also just point out that um, even if we, this is uh, the gray bar is from the, another different Canadian survey looking at uh, non-Indigenous peoples off reserve. And we see their uh, moderate, uh, the proportion with moderate and high levels of distress is lower um, than those who, First Nations who were not affected. And it's those who then uh, First Nations who were affected by residential schools who we see these really high levels of psychological distress. Just to give another example, uh, again using data from the First Nations Regional Health Survey. Um, so, and this is from the most recent um, RHS, which was done in 2015 16. And this is uh, looking at the proportion of First Nations adults and youth who seriously considered suicide at some point in their lifetime. And again, we see that those who are not affected by residential schools, um, both in adults and youth, have the lowest levels, uh, the lowest proportion um, who considered suicide. And then when we compare it to those with at least one grandparent and one parent, uh, both in adults and youth, we see these higher proportions um, who have seriously considered suicide relative to those not affected. Just to give another example, um, this is again from the most recent First Nations Regional Health Survey, um, looking at substance use outcomes. And again, we see the same, um, the same patterns where we see higher levels in children and grandchildren. But in fact, um, somewhat surprisingly, we saw that the levels among survivors themselves uh, were somewhat lower. And if uh, you can, there's a couple, we don't know why, but we have a couple of ideas and I'm happy to, to speculate with that you if you have any questions about that after. And so uh, these intergenerational effects that we're seeing associated with residential schools um, is consistent with research in other populations. So this is not something, a phenomenon that's unique to Indigenous peoples. Um, we know from research in other groups that um, stress and trauma can be transmitted across generations. And there are examples in other groups who have undergone similar collectively experienced traumas, meaning um, wh when the whole group um, undergoes the same, the same trauma um, and, and the whole group can be affected uh, at, the individual fam at the individual level and also at the family and community level. Um, and a, a lot of research has been done looking at the intergenerational consequences of the Holocaust uh, as well uh, Another example is consequences of the Great Famine in China and intergenerational effects of uh, refugee trauma. And so um, there's a lot of other groups, you know, experiencing similar phenomena, but of course they're going to look very different because of the different contexts uh, that each group faces. So uh, some of our other work has uh, not just looked at documenting these uh, intergenerational health and social outcomes, um, but we've also been trying to look at, you know, uh, different how inter intergenerational trauma affects people differently. Um, and again, this was a, this was done with data from the First Nations Regional Health Survey, so First Nations youth on reserve. Uh, and we looked at the proportion who seriously considered suicide in the past year. And again, uh, if we look at the total, the total population, we see those who, who had a parent who went to residential school has high levels of suicidal thoughts. But when we looked at it by gender, we see that um, it was particularly among young females where we see these strong intergenerational effects. And this is consistent with research um, at the time showing that First Nations uh, young females were particularly at risk uh, for suicide. And so, which is somewhat different than uh, what we see in other populations. And so again, it might be that, uh, you know, these intergenerational effects are implicated in, in some of these present day um, health and social inequities that we're seeing in particular subgroups of indigenous people, of First Nations people. Um, another thing we looked at was um, 
differences between kind of the younger youth, so those ages 12 to 14 and those ages 15 to 17. And what we found here is differences again, such that it was really in the younger group where we see these really strong, um, stronger intergenerational effects. We still see it in the older group, but it's particularly strong. And again, we're not sure, but um, you know, we're wondering if intergenerational trauma might be particularly associated with the early onset of certain um, health and social outcomes. And so that's something we're continuing to look at in the more recent to see if the same patterns are, are, are observed in the more recent data and maybe in, in, in First Nations off reserve as well. Another question um, that we really wanted to um, get at in our uh, research, and this is kind of speaking to um, historical, the concept of historical trauma, uh, which, which has a certain kind of definitions. And one of the, the aspects of the definitions is that is that risk associated with these historical trauma events can actually accumulate across generations. And so we wanted to see um, if, if the risk associated with uh, familial residential school attendance, if we see such um, accumulative effects. And we did see that in the 2008 and 10 um, RHS in relation to when we looked at levels of psychological distress and compared them between those who were not affected by residential schools, so they didn't attend or their parent or grand grandparent didn't attend. And we compared them to those with one previous generation, so a parent or a grandparent, and we see that that group has higher levels of distress compared to those not attending. But then we also compared them to those with two previous generations in their family who attended, so a parent and a grandparent, and it was in this group that we saw these particularly high levels of psychological distress, um, providing some evidence that it might be the case that these um, some of some of these intergenerational effects can actually accumulate across generation, uh, you know, without um, some type of intervention to to really address those effects from and stopping them from transmitting across generations. Just to give you another example of this kind of same pattern, uh, in another study. In another paper, um, we looked again at the same data set in 2008 and 10 in adults. And again, we found that this kind of same cumulative effect where we see the highest um, levels of, uh, of risk in those who had two previous generations, uh, a parent and a grandparent who attended versus those with uh, only one previous generation and those who were not affected. Um, another um, kind of finding that we, we think is very simple, but also very telling and, and important uh, in Canada, I think there's a myth that, um, you know, Indian res among non-Indigenous population that um, Indian residential schools happened so long ago and, um, you know, it doesn't really affect people today. And, um, and so we actually just looked at the proportion of First Nation children living on reserve, so uh, First Nations children, youth, and adults who were either directly or intergenerationally affected by residential schools. So they either had they either attended themselves or had a parent and or grandparent attend. And what we found was that um, across the different RHSs, um, that about three quarters of the First Nations population living on reserve um, has been affected by residential schools. Um, and that this has an actual that this proportion hasn't actually changed over the years. So it's still a significant proportion of this population living on reserve who's been affected. And of course, this is national, you know, like a, a mean of, of cross, and, and there's a lot of diversity across the different communities. Not all communities were affected, uh, or, or not all communities were affected to the same degree. Uh, or for the same length of time, um, but uh, you know, ju it just speaks to you know how how the, how large of an effect that this has had on so many First Nations peoples, and even those who didn't have a have a, a parent or grandparent or themselves attend, even those are still going to be affected by the community level effects, which I'll speak about a bit later on in the presentation. <clears throat> 
So the next, in this part of the presentation, I'll talk about our research that has explored the pathways involved in the intergenerational transmission of residential school experiences. First, um, our first studies that was published in 2011, where we looked at the relationship between parental residential school attendance and depressive symptoms. And we wanted to look at how different exposure to different stressors and trauma might mediate or account for that for those relationships so really again looking at these pathways um, from parental residential school attendance to depressive symptoms and what we found was that um, we asked uh, people about the their adverse childhood experiences so diff like the adverse childhood experience study in the U.S. we asked about different types of abuse different types of neglect and different types of uh, indices of household dysfunction and we added those up and we found that those with that parental residential school background were more likely to experience a greater number of adverse childhood experiences. And that in part accounted, led to their increased depressive symptoms. But we also found that those um, adverse childhood experiences also put them at risk for, um, for being exposed to more stress and trauma throughout their own lives such that um, those with a parent who attended also experienced a greater number of traumas in their adulthood. And they're also reporting higher levels of perceived discrimination. And all three of these, uh, tr these stressors and trauma when considered together um, accounted for this, for unique variance in this relationship between parental residential school attendance and depressive symptoms. In this same paper, um, we found not only were uh, children of residential school survivors more likely to report um, a greater number of, of stress and trauma, they're also more likely to be uh, affected by these traumas um, in, in relation to their depressive symptoms. So in this graph um, shows how on the bottom adverse childhood experiences on, on on the y-axis depressive symptoms. And we find that um, among those with no residential schools uh, parent background, um, we see these uh, high levels of depressive symptoms. Um, but, that's, but that said, um, those with that, at least one parent uh, who went to residential school, they, when they're exposed to these high levels of childhood adversities, they report even higher levels of depressive symptoms compared to those with that with no parents who attended. So they seem to be more susceptible or vulnerable to these negative effects of adverse childhood experiences. And just to compare, um, to give another example from another group, um, this is a study that was done with uh, the Jewish adults who were some of whom had been affected by the by the Holocaust by having a parent attend and others whose families were not affected by the Holocaust. And they looked at how being diagnosed with cancer, um, which they viewed as a stressor, was associated with depressive symptoms on the y-axis. And again, we see this same pattern where those with the non-Holocaust survivors, when they were exposed to, sorry, with a non-Holocaust background, when they were exposed to being diagnosed with cancer, uh, their depressive symptoms did go up, but it did not go up as sharply as we see when we look at those with that Holocaust background. So those who had that parent who, who were in the Holocaust were more affected in terms of their depressive symptoms when they were diagnosed with cancer. Uh, and this next study, we wanted to follow up on the finding from the previous study showing that those with a parent who went to residential school are perceiving higher levels of discrimination. And uh, what we did was we invited uh, First Nations adults to read a number of scenarios reflecting um, both subtle and blatant uh, discrimination scenarios that they would read. And after they read these scenarios, we would ask them um, to what degree they thought that this scenario represented discrimination. So that's what this um, discrimination appraisal, it means. We also asked them how threatened they were by this scenario. And then we also asked them about their depressive symptoms. 
And what we found was that those with a parental residential school background were more likely to appraise these scenarios as reflecting discrimination on the, on the part of the offender. They were more likely to uh, report uh, that this event could cause them harm or was threatening or, or could be upsetting for them. And in turn, um, these, these increased discrimination and threat appraisals accounted and for their higher levels of depressive symptoms that we found again. And we also wanted to look at what are some of the, the factors that might account for these individual differences. And we looked at um, both past discrimination experiences. So those um, with a parent who attended residential school, they're coming to read the scenarios with having higher levels of past discrimination. And so when they are encountering these new scenarios, that those past experiences, you know, are, 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 are maybe brought up consciously or unconsciously and seem to contribute to those um, increased likelihood of making these discrimination appraisals. Um, but in reality, it's probably some type of, you know, these statistical methods aren't perfect. Um, but so in reality, it's probably more of a, a circular relationship where we see you know, past discrimination leading to more, um, more a greater likelihood of a, attributing these scenarios to discrimination and that and then leads to more discrimination, kind of the circular um, pattern. Um, and then we also found that these past discrimination also had direct links with depressive symptoms. And the other variable we looked at is what is called in the literature as identity centrality. So it's just, which is really just one aspect of our cultural identity that specifically is uh, speaking to the salience of our group membership to our self-conscious concept. So to what degree does my First Nations um, identity, how, how important that is to how I define myself and, and, my, and my identity. And what we found that was that those um, who had a parent who went to residential school were more likely to report higher levels of these identity centralities. So they were more likely to um, view their First Nations identity as being important to the self-concept. And while in many cases, aspects of cultural identity are associated with positive outcomes, one of the negative outcomes that it's sometimes associated with is that I, uh, higher levels of centrality are associated with higher levels of discrimination. And that can make sense uh, if you think about you know, different people um, who have, you know, are more likely to think about their identity, are more likely to think about that in interactions with other people, including negative and potentially discriminatory uh, uh, encounters. So moving on to um, some of our other research that looked at other pathways involved in the transmission of trauma across uh, generations. Um, one of the major kind of topics we've looked at is how intergenerational communication about residential schools uh, in particular uh, might have uh, played a role in these, in these intergenerational effects. And uh, in, in this one um, paper we looked at, we asked um, First Nations adults at what stage of life they learned that their parents went to residential school. And what we found was um, that for a lot of people, they didn't actually learn that their own parent attended residential school until uh, adulthood. So here uh, we show that 36% reported that they learned that their parent was in residential school in childhood. Um, another 32% uh, reported that they learned in adolescence. And then the remaining people uh, reported that they didn't actually learn their parents went to residential school until young adulthood, uh, adulthood or late adulthood. And so that made us want to uh, look at this uh, lack of communication um, a little bit more. And in one of our studies, our more recent studies in 2020, um, we asked um, those who are affected by residential schools about their parental communication about residential schools. And we identified seven main th themes that came out of those uh, open-ended questions. And the first one was um, 
was that some people, and I, these were the people that reported that they learned early in life and that their parents actually did talk to them. Uh, some of them reported over disclosure and too much discussion um, at an early age that affected them. Uh, for example, this person shared that my mother shared her experiences with me and it was frightening. As a child, I always felt sorry for her because the system had been so mean to her. I felt like a small adult when she told me these horrible stories. She would tell me these stories mostly when she was drunk and she would cry and I felt very sad and afraid. So as you can imagine, um, having too much and uh, maybe overly too much information or details can potentially be harmful for young children. Um, we also found that another theme was that in those, particularly in those who reported that their parents uh, didn't speak to them very much uh, in childhood uh, about their residential schools, um, that even though they didn't get these direct details, they had some kind of idea still that their parents were affected by past trauma. And it led to a lot of kind of speculation in the children and wondering um, in the midst of kind of this silence about it. Uh, this person shared, I always knew that my father went to residential school. We never knew why he was so angry or why he would never talk about what happened at residential school. I still have a hate for him, even though residential school was why the, he was the way he was. We also um, heard about, about positive experiences that were spoken about to children about their parents' time at residential school. Um, and, and, you know, most of the, there's trauma and neglect and abuse is obviously negative experiences, but um, there were still um, some positive experiences and, and resilience and resistance um, within residential schools among the students. Um, for example, um, I've heard stories from my own grand grandparents about, uh, you know, the hockey team and how they enjoyed playing. My, my, my uncle enjoyed playing on the hockey team. And so there are some positive uh, experiences, but in, despite um, some people reporting that, they were often kind of also accompanied by a kind of a negative uh, part along with it. And just to give you an example, um, this person shared that uh, this person described how his father used to run track and cross country and how he, and he would talk about how he would travel to local track meets with the white schools and would, be, would come home with first place ribbons. This story seemed to start with a sense of pride, but he spoke about how on a few occasions he was pulled out of class and driven to fields around the res. He said they would point in the direction and explain that younger students were on the run and it was his job to get them back. My dad said he would do as instructed and he would come across younger students trying to find their way home. My dad said he would often drag them back or hold them down until staff came to pick them up. He said at the time he didn't consider the abuse these young kids faced being boarders and how badly they wanted to escape. He's felt guilty for catching them and as he put it, I should have let them go. So while he talked about these positive experiences, you know, it also comes with this, this neg really uh, I think traumatic and, and negative uh, um, experiences as well. A lot of people also spoke about um, cultural pride and about how a lot of the parents who went to residential school um, made, a, kind of a, made it an effort to uh, kind of, again, resist uh, the, the cultural shaming and instill cultural pride, both in themselves and in the next generation. This person said, I have made a concerted effort with my own children to reintroduce them to our language and culture and to instill pride in their Aboriginal roots. Another theme that came up was um, parents talking about uh, discrimination that they've faced um, and how that's negative effect affected them. So for example, uh, one person shared, I grew up knowing I was less than white people. Um, and then we also heard stories of, of discrimination, not only from non-Indigenous peoples, but from within, uh, from other First Nations and Indigenous people, uh, which is often referred to as lateral violence. 
And uh, this person said, I, I see how we oppress one another and I don't want to buy into it, but I do. I do, I do back to other natives what they do to me. A lot of us just don't like each other and it stems from residential school. Another theme uh, that was uh, talked about a lot was the cultural disruption across generations as a result of residential school. Uh, this person shared, I have no knowledge of being a father. I should have been taught how to raise my children traditionally, but my father lost that in residential school and therefore so have I. Another person shared, uh, talked about the loss of culture and language was by far the largest impact. English was the first language in our house growing up and I was not even aware that I was Aboriginal until 10 years old or so. Finally, a lot of people talk about healing, healing in survivors and in the next generation. Um, this person shared, I dealt with all those hard emotional issues and began to build my life as someone with self-esteem. I eventually settled into who I was, my culture, and learned about residential schools and started a path of forgiveness for those that have harmed me. So, so far I've talked about uh, really more um, individual and family levels effects. Um, but I'd also like to emphasize that um, when we're talking about um, whole communities that we also see these effects at the community level. Um, and we, that was one of the questions we had in, in this uh, study that was done, that came out in two th 2014, that was commissioned by the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. And um, this was a qualitative study specifically exploring uh, student to student abuse that occurred in residential schools. So abuse, not just from the, the people who work there, but from other students. And we did this by speaking to um, health service providers who had worked with residential school survivors, just because um, this was the first study that we were aware of that looked at this. And, and we just wanted to get an idea um, before speaking with survivors themselves um, to understand how it's impacted them. And, and this study has addressed several questions, um, the factors that contributed to student to student abuse, the effects on those abused, the effects on those who perpetrated abuse. And also we wanted to look at, at the collective effects in communities. And, and I'm just gonna focus on those collective effects today. If anybody has questions about other parts of the study afterwards, I'm happy uh, to speak to those. So in terms of the collective effects, one of the main um, collective effects that was talked about was how it affects relationships in the community. And again, this term lateral violence uh, came up quite a bit. Um, to give an example, um, this, this health care provider, uh, and I should mention actually that a lot of these health care providers were, the, were themselves um, Indigenous and were themselves affected by residential schools. So some people are actually speaking about their own experiences as well. So this person shared it, it is part of the systematic way that people in power used to teach us, the staff at residential school. They were abusers. They had to make sure we also knew how to be abusers, not only of other people, but to have hatred against ourselves. Abuse begat more abuse and bullying was only one form of it. And today we see this in First Nations schools. And again, in our previous study about intergenerational communication, that was also something that came out uh, as well. Um, another theme that came out was how residential schools have contributed to community violence and child abuse in communities and how that is um, somewhat of a norm in, in some communities, but not all uh, I'd like to point out. So this person shared that I think what is important to ask is how many abusers being students went home into the community thinking they were allowed to at residential school, that they continue abusing their loved ones at home and how this cycle of hurting one another has been passed on for generations. Another um, one of the collective effects that was discussed was this silence regarding residential school experiences and the contemporary uh, outcomes like violence and abuse. Um, so many, I think if not most of these uh, healthcare providers we spoke to talked about how this 
in the many communities, there's this silence. And up until recently, there, there hadn't been uh, a lot of discussions and people still wanted to kind of keep it hidden away. Um, one person shared, it has not been safe for people to make those kinds of disclosures in their own families and communities for fear of being ostracized and being told that they're lying and to stop making trouble. Another person shared that they wouldn't name their, the person who abused them because they were afraid of retaliation because their abusers were now in leadership positions or ahead of a program that the individual happened to utilize. And that was particularly problematic um, because uh, in the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement in Canada, um, all students got a, a common experience payment just for attending that was determined by the number of years they went to residential school. But there was another aspect where they actually had to uh, list all of the abuse that they suffered, and they even were asked to name their abusers. And so this became very problematic uh, when it started when, when it was realized that a lot of students were abused by other students. And um, this process that was put into place by the government, you know, didn't consider this and it was causing um, a lot of people didn't want to name their abusers because there were others in the communities and there was still long term, you know, conflicts uh, within the community around around those so that that process was very problematic. And so moving on, um, still looking at these different pathways involved in the transmission of residential school trauma across generations. We haven't actually looked at this yes, yet, but I'd just like to point out that um, one thing you know, that has been looked at in other groups and that might be the case for Indigenous peoples are different biological pathways that are involved and different Indigenous um, Indigenous researchers like Dr. Karina Walters has advocated for more research trying to look at um, the embodiment of historical trauma and, and looking at how different biological factors might be involved um, in this transmission across generations. And just to give you an example, um, our team is getting more and more questions uh, asking about whether or not epigenetic factors could be involved in the transmission of residential school experiences or other aspects of colonialism across generations. And so for those who, uh, who aren't familiar with epigenetics, um, it's really uh, in the past 20 to 30 years become understood that, you know, genetics, our genes don't in itself uh, dis, uh, describe our or predict our development and it's really um, the interaction between our genes and our environment. So what we now know uh, through research is that experiences can actually uh, change the expression of our genes um, so that you can have different outcomes based on whether you have a protective environment or a negative environment. And um, just to give you an example, uh, oops, in another group, um, the only group we're aware of that has looked at this is in the context of the Holocaust. And, as, and what they're finding is that they're seeing these um, intergeneration, similar inter intergenerational effects in relation to uh, anxiety and distress. And that in some cases, they do see differences in these epigenetic factors um, that seem to... Um, that could potentially explain why, why we are seeing these um, different mental health outcomes. And so that's something um, that more and more Indigenous peoples are being are, are be becoming interested in. And, and epigenetics is just one of the potential biological pathways that might be involved. Um, genetics could be involved, and there are a whole lot of other biological factors, um, such as those involved in the stress response system um, and our gut microbiome. And again, if anybody has any questions about that, it's not my particular expertise, but I could give it my best shot if you have any questions afterwards. And I just wanted to talk, talk about, um, about one of our new initiatives that's being led by the Thunderbird Partnership Foundation to create ethical space for First Nations led biological research. And we started this because 
um, the Thunderbird Partnership Foundation, which is a uh, First Nations mental health and addictions um, organization led by uh, Carol Hopkins, who I have here uh, in this picture. Um, we had discussions probably, I think over five years ago, and, and they were one of the groups that were really interested in learning about epigenetics. Um, and in particular, they were interested in learning about epigenetics because in contrast to just, you know, a genetic deterministic uh, view of human, human development, um, the new understandings around how epigenetics uh, determines our, our human development is more in line with indigenous knowledge around human biology and development. So they were really keen to learn about this. And so um, what we've done is uh, started creating a two-eyed seeing curriculum for First Nations communities to create capacity to make informed decisions about collective and individual participation in genetic, epigenetic, and other research projects involving the collection of biospecimens. And so this training, uh, we have an online portion that, that gives, uh, teaches about um, our, the stress, stress response system, um, at the epigenetics, genetics, and the microbiome, and also just teaches about what are the potential benefits of considering these biological factors in health research um, and how it might um, benefit First Nations. And on the flip side, also, what are the ethical considerations and research that need to be considered uh, beyond just regular research? Um, you know, because a uh, collection of these biospecimens brings some additional unique um, ethical and practical considerations that need to be considered. So um, we, this project's already underway and our first study was really led by the Thunderbird Partnership Foundation who um, spoke with indigenous knowledge holders across Canada uh, about human biology, about indigenous knowledge related to human biology and determinants of health. And, and, and currently we are rolling out our pilot of this two wide seeing curriculum for certain First Nations organizations in Canada. And we're evaluating it uh, as a tool for um, First Nations led biological research. And then we're also um, going to be throughout these pilots um, getting feedback and, and asking for these First Nations groups around their views towards biological research and whether they support it, whether they want more education you know, and what they need um, if they are interested. And it's really, um, you know, we're not, there's no um, kind of pushing communities. It's really just giving them the information to make their own choices around this. So moving on um, back to our residential school research, um, one of the next questions we wanted to look at was, um, whether or not different collective traumas are linked and does risk accumulate across these different collective traumas. So, you know, as we know, residential schools was only one aspect of all many uh, negative aspects of colonialism. And, um, and more recently, uh, the 60s scoop in Canada during the 1950s to the 1990s um, as the residential school system was winding down, um, they continued their kind of assimilation policies through the child welfare system. And uh, during this time, Indigenous children were scooped from, uh, from their families and placed in non-Indigenous uh, families. And, um, and even today, um, we see significant um, disparities in the child welfare system where too many Indigenous children, First Nations children are being taken from their families. And, and, and I'll just read this quote from Dr. Lawrence Kermeyer, um, that many have argued that the child welfare system through its large scale removal of Aboriginal children from their families, culture and communities be considered a continuation of the policies of forced assimilation of the residential school system. And today, um, Indigenous children represent just over half of children in, in care, but, but only represent about 7.7% of children in the Canadian population. So those are huge, huge ongoing inequities that we're seeing in the child welfare system, um, which varies across, across the country with it being even worse in, in some, in some uh, provinces. 
So this was our first um, study, uh, I think published in, in uh, 2020, um, that looked at whether or not there's this association between um, familial residential school attendance and the likelihood of, of someone themselves being affected by the child welfare system. And so here we have, um, this is the proportion who's either at some point in their life been adopted, been in foster care or in a group home and, and separated from uh, their parents by the child welfare system. And this is data that we collected ourselves. So it's not a representative uh, population. It's a self-selective sample um, of First Nations um, living across Canada. And so we found that in the total sample, uh, about 20% reported that they themselves had been affected by the child welfare system. And, but then when we looked at it by the different um, uh, like familial IRS attendance groups, we found uh, big differences such that those not affected were the least likely to be affected by residential schools. Those who had a grandparent only who attended were more likely. And then those who had at least one parent attended, uh, attended were the most 32% uh, um, had been affected by the child welfare system. So um, this is the same study. This is the same graph I just showed you. I just wanted to kind of show you bigger. Um, but we also looked at um, other types of uh, household dysfunction in uh, and compared them against those not affected um, by to those affected by residential schools. And again, we see across all of these outcomes um, that those affected by residential schools are more likely to have these um, negative uh, household adversities while they were growing up. So this is household economic instability, household general instability, um, household substance abuse. Again, we see those affected by residential schools much higher than those not affected. Um, likewise with household depressive, uh, household depression or mental illness. So how, whether or not there was someone in the, in the household with a mental illness and household suicide attempts. And what I'll just point out is it's particularly or only in these mental health outcomes where we see these kind of cumulative effects where those with the grandparent and grandparent, uh, parent and grandparent who attended having the highest levels, but we don't seem to see these cumulative effects um, in relation to these other outcomes. Um, and then the last one was um, having a household member in prison. And again, we see those affected by residential schools, uh, a greater proportion have been affected compared to those not affected by residential schools. And then in the same uh, paper, we wanted to see, uh, so we looked at, again, parental residential school attendance were more likely to be affected by the child welfare system. And we added up the exposure to those different childhood uh, household adversity factors. And we found that indeed those with a parent who went to residential school were more likely to have a higher cumulative exposure to these childhood adversities. And in turn, this accounted um, for some of this relationship uh, between parental IRS and being affected by the child welfare system. So this was uh, another more recent study where we wanted to look at, th that was our first paper. So we wanted another paper just to kind of, again, look at the same, um, the same relationships in a different population. And this was a two paper, uh, a, sorry, a two study paper. Um, the first study was looking at First Nations and, and some Métis people from across Canada. And again, we found that those same relationships between having uh, a parent or grandparent who went to residential school um, being more likely to have a, a child welfare background compared to those not affected. And what we added in this uh, paper was we wanted to look at how being affected by the child welfare system itself was also was a, if that was uh, also associated with these increased depressive symptoms and psychological distress and other outcomes. So in this first paper, we looked at depressive symptoms and uh, we found that um, those who had been affected by the child welfare system indeed had higher levels of depressive symptoms compared to those uh, not affected by the child welfare system. So like residential schools, we're seeing these negative effects 
Um, and then after, and then we also did an analysis um, predicting predicting depressive symptoms where we put both their familial residential school uh, background and their child welfare system history into the model. And we found that both uh, continued to account for unique variants in it, the increased depressive symptoms. Um, and so both of these factors, while they are related, both of them continue to seem to be predictive of these higher levels of distress. So this was doing something similar um, using the First Nations Regional Health Survey. So again, this population-based survey in First Nations, and this was specifically looking at youth. And here in this survey, in the last, in the previous iterations, they have not asked about the child welfare system. So we couldn't look at that specifically, but the survey did ask uh, about whether or not um, the youth live with uh, any any or both of their biological parents. So that was what we looked at was whether we looked at whether they lived with uh, both parents, one parent or none. And again, we found the similar uh, findings such that um, those with with at least one parent, grandparent or both are showing these increased uh, risks of not living with uh, not living with their with their biological parents while growing up. And again, we wanted to look at how the relationship between being separated from their parents while growing up in relation to psychological distress, which is measured in the RHS. And so here we, we compare um, those who do not live with either biological parent, those who live with at least one biological parent, and those who lives with both. And we see it's those who don't live with either of their biological parents who are at a greater risk of psychological distress. So not only do residential schools have this increased risk for, for psychological stress, but also um, personal experiences with the child welfare system, which is not surprising. And um, when we put both familial residential school history and um, one's personal history with this child welfare system, again, both of those variables continued to be um, significant. So accounting for unique variants in the higher levels of distress, uh, um, again, among those affected. So now um, I'll just move on to the next section uh, where I'm talking about our research that assesses the links between cultural identity and engagement uh, with well-being. So this was from an early study um, in 2010 that when we first started um, this program of research. And uh, I, we looked at three, there's, there's many different aspects of culture and cultural identity. So we try to look at different ones uh, specifically because we find that different aspects of culture and cultural identity have unique relationships with uh, different health and social outcomes. So as an example, we looked at, in this study, we looked at what's referred to in the literature as in-group affect, but really just uh, is, is measured asking questions about cultural pride. Do you feel good about your cultural identity? Do you, are you glad to be uh, part, of your, part of your group? Um, and what we find that those who have higher levels of cultural pride are, are, are more likely to uh, report lower levels of perceived discrimination, which we know is associated with bad outcomes. And indeed, we found that higher levels of cultural pride were also associated with lower levels of depressive symptoms. So this direct kind of pr protective effect. And in the same study, we also looked at um, identity centrality, which is another aspect of cultural identity that I mentioned earlier, um, which is really talking about the degree to which a person um, considers their uh, cultural identity to be central to their self-concept. And in contrast to, cultural, to, to the cultural pride variable, we found opposite relationships such that higher levels of identity centrality are associated with higher levels of discrimination. And again, we, we found that in that previous study where, and, and it can make sense when you think about that on its own, that the more I think about my identity, the more I'm likely to uh, think about that in interactions with other peoples. And so if I have a negative interaction and I'm thinking about my identity, I might be more likely to attribute that 
negative interaction as being due to discrimination because of my, my First Nations heritage. Um, we also found this kind of positive relationship that higher centrality, higher depressive symptoms. And from our other research, we know that this is really accounted for by those higher levels of perceived discrimination. So um, yeah, so just to point out that, you know, we, we often just kind of say that culture and cultural identity is protective and it often is, but it's a bit more complicated than that. And so our research is really trying to um, determine what factors are protective in relation to what outcomes in what contexts. Um, in this same study, uh, we looked not only at these direct relationships, but how these um, aspects of cultural identity might moderate the relationship between perceived discrimination and depressive symptoms. And just to describe a bit what I mean by, by moderate, um, when we look at perceived discrimination and depressive symptoms, that relationship, we know that the higher levels of discrimination, we see higher levels of depressive symptoms. But when we look at each group, those with um, low levels of in-group A effect represented by the dotted line, so low levels of cultural identity uh, versus those with high levels of cultural identity, we see differences such that those with low levels of cultural pride are have these really high levels of depressive symptoms when they face high levels of perceived discrimination. But those with um, high levels of cultural pride seem to be somewhat buffered by that, by that jump in depressive symptoms when faced with high, high levels of discrimination. So we see this buffering effect. But again, in contrast, when we looked at uh, levels of centrality, uh, identity centrality as the moderator, we found the opposite effect um, such that those with low, uh, so, sorry, high centrality had higher levels of depressive symptoms in relation to pre and when, when confronted with high levels of discrimination and those with low centrality were less affected by that discrimination. So again, showing these opposite effects of these different aspects of cultural identity. Um, we've also looked at other um, aspects of cultural identity. Um, and this is a, a study that just came out um, and uh, was led by one of my students, Jocelyn Paul, who's a Mi'kmaq student. And um, this again was using the First Nations Regional Health Survey. So looking at First Nations youth on reserve. And in this study, we looked at the relationship between bullying and psychological distress. And, and, and as predicted, we found this uh, relationship such that the more students, the more these youth uh, experience bullying, the more uh, the higher levels of distress they experience. And we looked at um, the strength of their community belonging, their feelings of community belonging, and looked at how that might moderate this relationship between um, bullying and distress. And what we find here is that um, among those who are bullied, um, those with strong belonging, we see that they are somewhat buffered against these negative effects of bullying in relation to discrimination. So again, we see this kind of buffering effect of have a feeling that they belong in their community and that is protective against bullying. And just to give you an example of uh, research by another group who's actually looked at how uh, at, at a biological outcome. Um, so they looked at the relationship between perceived discrimination and, al and mean allostatic load scores. And what that is, uh, allostatic load is just a biological index of stress using seven biomarkers assessing uh, neuro neuroendocrine, cardiovascular, metabolic, and immune system functioning. So they uh, calculate these scores based on all of these biological measurements and again, what they found was that the more, the, the higher the discrimination, uh, the higher the levels of allostatic load of biological stress. And they looked at cultural engagement. Uh, it says cultural and community, cultural continuity here, but they really just measured uh, the degree to which these university students were engaged in cultural activities. And similar to our findings, they found that those with the high levels um, of cultural 
uh, continuity were buffered against the negative effects of, of discrimination, um, particularly um, at the high levels of discrimination. So um, yeah, these, these aspects of cultural identity uh, are, are serving as protective factors. And this is just a, a study done in a non-Indigenous population, but also kind of uh, was a study that got our partners at the Thunderbird Partnership Foundation uh, excited uh, at the potential to look at some of these biological factors and how they might play a role in understanding religion, uh, resilience or the protective effects of culture. So this study um, looked at, again, discrimination and um, certain epigenetic outcomes co called epigenetic aging. And the moderator that they looked at was having a, a, a supportive family environment. So they compared those with low uh, support family environments and high support family environments. And what they found was that those with the low supportive environments, you see this, uh, this strong relationship between um, being exposed to discrimination and these negative epigenetic aging outcomes. But those with the high supportive family environments buffered against that negative effect of discrimination. So, um, you know, we see these in the outcomes, but there are also um, biological um, factors that could also be play, playing a role in um, these outcomes. Amy, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I do want to allow time for our audience to engage with you with questions and answers. So I wonder if you don't mind taking just a minute to maybe wind up for us. Yes, absolutely. I'm almost there. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Okay, so very, very lastly, um, just I've spoken about individual level protective factors. I just wanted to note, you know, there are also others have looked at um, cultural factors at the collective level. And so I, so that also seems to be important. I'll just leave it at that. I can talk about that uh, if anybody has questions. And this last slide is, second last slide is just speaking to um, resistance and resilience following intergenerational residential school experiences. Again, from the First Nations Regional Health Survey, we're finding that those who've been affected by residential schools are actually more likely than those not affected to engage in their cultural, cultural traditions. And last slide, um, we're also finding that uh, these similar narratives in our qualitative data. This person shared, I think my mom showed me more than she told me. She's very traditional as practice our culture in front of me when she could. My mother's re remained a very traditional woman and has maintained her language. She's always been a very proud native woman. And so I'm gonna end it at that. I'm gonna skip the part that kind of shows how we've been using our research, but I can answer questions uh, about that. I think I was trying to fit a bit too much in there today. <laughs> Well, um, it's amazing, beautiful work, and it's so programmatic. And um, you know, we're really delighted and grateful that you joined us today to share this stuff. And I'm sorry that there wasn't time for every um, piece of it, but I think you provided us with a great deal of terrific uh, data-driven information that is really educational, but also um, you know important to stimulate our thinking as researchers and scientists for those of us who that do that part. Um, I, you know, we have um, some questions in the, and, and one I'll just take to uh, offer an opportunity for you to say a little more about what residential schools might have been like experientially. Um, uh, one, one participant writes, during how much of the year did children live at the residential schools? And I'm struck by, you know, for the native audience, we're pro probably pretty familiar with these things, but we have a non-native audience too, who doesn't, you know, they might think, well, wait, isn't this like, you know, preparatory school? What's going on here? So you obviously address this a little bit, and maybe you could say just a bit more about what was it like for students at these schools? Sure. Um... Yeah, so students, I mean, I'll start by saying if the experiences, you know, varied across different residential schools, across different time periods, but in generally, they are, they are definitely not the same as your typical uh, kind of boarding schools, you know, uh, as I mentioned, these, this was by law, parent, students and children were taken forcibly from their parents. And um, the whole goal of it was explicitly to, to assimilate them. And there wasn't a lot of care about, about indigenous peoples. So these schools were uh, very much underfunded and led to significant abuse and neglect. Um, not the right 
people working in these schools who cared about who cared about children. It attracted a lot of um, predators um, who you know who are saw this as an opportunity to to abuse children. Um, we know that there were medical ex, uh, you know, experiments, uh, nutritional experiments that that were allowed to go on in these schools, and they were just really quite horrific. And if you want to learn a bit more of those details, um, I I, said, I recommend you reading the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report that came out in 2015, which really goes into detail about that historical aspect of residential schools and what it was really like. Um, and while, you know, there were some people that have some positive experience as a whole, it's very, it's accepted that it's very, it was a very harmful and negative experience for most. Thanks for that. And you again mentioned truth and reconciliation. And of course, you already did, did reference that and talked about the common experience payment and so on. But you know, this TRC was kind of a big deal, and it's a model for the world to be thinking about how does it engage with truth and reconciliation with Indigenous people. So could you say just a bit more about the TRC as well? Sure, yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it went uh, across Canada for, I think, about four years leading up to 2015 and held um, gatherings where... Um, and I was, I was actually part of some of the teams that led the statement taking um, of survivors and, and their descendants. And really anyone who was affected by residential schools could come and give their statement. Um, and so statements were collected from across Canada and it really, a lot of people, you know, described how uh, just being able to say their story on the record uh, was a very important part of healing for them. Um, but at the same time, there, it's not also, wasn't easy. It was kind of hard for a lot of people. And there were some complaints that there weren't enough su uh, supports because bringing this trauma back up without the adequate supports um, also, you know, is, is a risk is kind of risky business. And um, so it was hard for people, but it was also very healing. And, um, and yeah, and I think, you know, it's different than other truth commissions because there was no uh, you know, legal repercussions for perpetrators or anything like that. Um, so it was really more about just getting to the truth and allowing allowing survivors to share their truths and share their stories. And did it really contribute to more truth and reconciliation in Canada? Um, you know, still after the, the TRC in 2015, when we look at some of these like uh, awareness surveys, um, that are done asking people, you know, how aware of you of the residential school system. There's still a lot of people in Canada who didn't really know about it or who didn't, um, who, you know, who, who don't, you know, haven't thought about our, our shared history of colonialism in Canada. So I think there's still, even after that, a lot of education uh, that needs to happen and, and Canadians still need to learn a lot more about, about truth and, and reconciliation and what that really means. Thank you. Yeah, it, um, really important process and set of uh, commitments up there. Um, in some of the work that you presented, you re referred to the surveys, for example, of on reserve Indigenous folks, um, and you were comparing folks who didn't have a history of IRS with those who were survivors or parents and grandparents. Um, do you have any sense for what proportion of Native peoples went to residential school throughout this long history? Yeah, well, um... So I presented that one uh, that one slide that looked at um, maybe I'll bring it up. Why well, I, I can just describe it. Um, we and this was specifically looking at First Nations on reserve, um, and we looked at the proportion who either themselves were affected, had a parent and or grandparent who attended, and in the most recent survey, it was about seventy five percent of the First Nations population living on reserve who had been directly or indirectly affected. So I think, again, a lot of Canadians, uh, that's a big surprise to them. They kind of want to view it as something of the past that doesn't directly affect today's contemporary population, but it's still, you know, it's, it wasn't that long ago, the last school closed in 1996. So it still is uh, really, you know, affecting a large proportion of the population today. And we, I do have uh, the proportions in First Nations off reserve, Inuit and Métis, and it's definitely the highest in First Nations on reserve, but it's still significant uh, proportions of the population in these other groups as well.
Thank you. Um, here's a question. Um, well, it's more of a comment. In my experience, those of us who are American Indian do not always know if our parents or grandparents went to residential schools and sometimes don't even know the identity of those who came before us. And of course, you address this in um, part of your research, uh, you know, around when did people even find out that their parents or grandparents had. Um, I think this raises the question in part relative in part to your discussion of identity centrality and, um, you know, the question of meaning making. Um, how much of the impacts and effects that we're talking about have to do with awareness and consciousness and and uh, the conveyance or communication of pain and suffering versus processes that might result in greater symptoms and adverse health outcomes, even if they don't know that their parents or grandparents went to residential school. Yeah, so, you know, there's, we have only looked at some of the pathways and there are many more uh, social, psychological, biological pathways that you know, can be accounting for these intergenerational transmission, um, you know, if, you know, for the, for example, for the biological pathways, you know, that can happen unconsciously without you having any awareness of what's going on. Um, and I've also described those who didn't know that their parents went to residential school, but growing up, picked up on for, through nonverbal and kind of indirect communication that their parents went through something bad and traumatic. So the child, but, but that parent's trauma, their trauma is gonna impact their parenting. And so the ch again, the child might not know about the history, but they're gonna be impacted. Um, but I think there is a, also a role for um, parental communication and trying to find out, you know, what are the things that we can pass on and, and what are the stories to tell and share across generations that can be protective. And I think um, there's, an, there's some more findings that we did that I didn't share here today because I couldn't fit it all in, but um, we looked at that in a quantitative way and we found that uh, kind of this quadratic relationship where like uh, when there was, the, at, high, at low and high levels of communication, the depressive symptoms were higher, but it was like at this medium sweet spot where they, they talked at it, not too much, not too little, little, that the depressive symptoms were lower. So I think it's important uh, to, to, to teach about residential schools uh, so that people understand that these health inequities we see today, which we all know are there, are not something that's inherent to them genetically or as a people or culturally, but it really it, of why these disparities exist. But at the same time, especially when you're talking to children, you know, at a young age, or, uh, to not be going into over too much detail about the trauma or too much overemphasis on racism. Um, you know, they need to know it, it exists, but it needs to be balanced with stories of resilience and strength and um, all these other good things that can you know promote these positive outcomes. So I think it's really about finding this balance um, between between sharing the truth, but also have it couched in in you know in, in stories of strength and resilience and hope for for future generations. Well said, thank you. Um, here's a question: uh, You mentioned that different aspects of cultural identity have unique outcomes on health and well-being. For example, cultural pride is protective against discrimination, whereas identity centrality is not. I'm wondering what we can do with this knowledge in terms of better protecting ourselves against discrimination. Yeah, I think um, I think that discrimination seems to be such a huge predictor of, of health outcomes. And there hasn't been a lot of research around um, you know, what are the be best ways, interventions, things that we, uh, aside from interventions of the non-Indigenous population, which they need their interventions because they need to stop with the racism. But if we're just looking at, our, at, at ourselves, um, you know, and it's not to say it's bad to have identity centrality be because that leads to more dis discrimination. I think what we really want to focus on is, you know, if you have this it's good to have high levels of identity centrality, but I think it needs to be accompanied by these other good protective aspects of, of identity, like cultural pride, like feelings of belonging. Um, and just to give another example, like 
uh, when you, a lot of studies just measure cultural identity by looking at how much they engage in, in their traditional culture. Uh, but I think that it's also, and it's important to look at the context. So some research has shown that, for example, um, engagement in culture, for example, if we look at smoking, um, in First Nations communities, engagement in, in culture is, is actually, in First Nations culture is actually at risk for more smoking just because of the, of how it's tied in, 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 in into the culture. But on the opposite side, acculturation, so how much they're, they're embedded in non-Indigenous cultures protective against smoking. But on the flip side, if we look at substance use, it's the opposite. So engagement in traditional culture is protective against substance use, whereas engagement in non-Indigenous culture is associated with more substance use. So it really depends on the specific outcome you're looking at and how it's tied into the context and how it's tied into the social norms. And, and you might find different relationships between two variables in, in two different contexts. So, so it, it's really complicated and we need to really consider, you know, what outcome we're looking at and, 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 and in what context we're looking at. And, and we're finding out that it's, it is very, um, you know, it's very complicated, but I think, you know, what, we, what I think we can focus on is the consistence is where like cultural pride, I've never seen that linked to a negative outcome. I've never seen belonging linked to a negative outcome. So, you know, really focusing on those positive things and, and then understanding of those other variables that can kind of go both ways and how do we make sure that it has the positive outcome and not the negative one. Fantastic. And um, I, there are some members of our audience who probably do have to step away because we advertise this to end about now. But if if you're OK, Professor Bombay, maybe we can take another five minutes because there are a lot of questions, a lot of sure. engaged people. Thank you so much. Um, here's one. Um, I applaud your important line of work and efforts to uncover both risk and protective factors. Have you looked into other protective factors such as spirituality, traditional First Nation spirituality, general spirituality, religiosity? Um. So we haven't ourselves, um, and, and, and partly because a lot of our work is with the First Nations Information Government Center using the Regional Health Survey, um, we're kind of limited to the questions they ask. Um, and so, and they don't ask specifically about that. But um, yeah, I think, you know, we haven't done that. I know that others have and have found protective of like, uh, Melissa Walls and Les Whitbeck have also looked at a lot of uh, different aspects of cultural identity in relation to different outcomes. And uh, I know I th they have asked about spirituality, I think in particular, and have found protective effects. But again, I suspect that depending on the outcomes, you might find different relationships, but I think that's something that needs a lot more work to really untangle these, these, these different relationships between these related yet different uh, variables. Thanks. Um, you know, someone also asks about the implications for the uh, processes you're studying of the um, report of possible unmarked graves at some of the former residential schools. I wonder what your thoughts are in response to that. Um, yeah, I mean, that, uh, the, the unmarked graves that have come out and, you know, I think that has been is something that Indigenous First Nations communities have known uh, have known about. It's, it wasn't a surprise for them. It was written about in the TRC report. Um, but what it has done in, in Canada, and I think maybe across you know across the world, is is a really caught people's attention even more so than the whole Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We've seen a lot more awareness in Canada based on the uh, public opinion surveys um, that really seem to. I think get people's hearts, um, and so I think it's raised a lot more awareness, and people want continuing to want to learn more in Canada. Um, that's how I see that affecting, yeah, these issues in Canada at least. Thanks. Um, here's someone who wrote. I'm curious about the study of the student to student abuse, lateral violence. How was this similar and different from the bullying, perpetration, and victimization that goes on in schools, unfortunately, in majority culture? Can you comment on this? 
Yeah. Um, so th that study was done a while ago. I should have brushed up on it, but but generally what we found was um, that there were that it was common. Like we didn't. There was, had been no previous study uh, that looked at that. It was kind of something that was almost stigmatized, and and they, people didn't want to talk about. But when you but in, in our report, we did a lit, lit review of, um, of similar kind of residential schools with other populations. And what you found is, is that student to student abuse is very common in even regular boarding schools, uh, the boarding schools in Ireland. And that, that is, it's just a common phenomenon when you put children together without enough uh, adult supervision and all of these risk factors that are present. Um, and what we also found was that we, there seemed to be unique outcomes associated with uh, being abused by, by the people who worked in the schools versus by being abused by other students. Um, and and in, and like in some ways, they describe it as being more uh, harmful and more hurtful and distressing for them, which we, you know, could be explained uh, by kind of the, this notion of betrayal trauma that when you're expecting support from someone and then you're kind of betrayed by someone you think that you should get support from, it can be have even worse outcomes. Um, one of the, and, and one of the unique outcomes was just kind of fostering a, a lack of trust to other First Nations people and feeling you can't really trust anybody. And, and so those who are abused by their students kind of had these unique outcomes that um, on top of the, the, the outcomes that they faced as a result of, of abuse from, from those who worked in the schools. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Well, just do one final closing question here. Um, what do you think are the most important practical implications of your research? Are there potential misuses that you might caution us about? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think like, so where our research has been really, uh, has a, had a lot of impact is in, in just teaching people about it. Uh, we do a lot of education to different groups, but particularly we've seen big outcomes as when, when, when I've been an expert witness in, in different um, court cases and tribunals. Um, for example, I was an expert witness in, um, in when the Assembly of First Nations and the Child and Family Caring Society in Canada uh, took Canada to court for uh, racism against First Nations children through underfunding of health and social services on reserve. And our research showed, uh, supported their case by showing how residential schools have led to this increased need for health and social services on, on reserve. Uh, and yet when it's faced with these underfunding, it's just gonna, it just has perpetuated these across generations. And so that led, uh, they won that case, which was the biggest settlement in Canadian history and led to $40 billion uh, going to uh, First Nations for child welfare services. Uh, and they were ordered to rectify these inequities in funding on, on, in First Nations communities going back years. Um, so that has been a big outcome. Um, but I would say in terms of cautioning, um, you know, when I'm in, when I'm in those situations, I really, in court, you want to show the harms, 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 because that's how, you know, that's what they're looking for. But when I'm kind of speaking more broadly to people, I don't want to just focus on the harms again, like I, like I, I want to be able to balance that with the stories of resilience and strength and resistance, because I, we don't want to just perpetuate this kind of idea that we're all victims and all sick and all and that and so I think that's the risk and so that's why when I present um, I truly try to to make that balance because we want that message is going out to to everyone else about how strong and resilient we are as well well thank you on that note allow me to convey my gratitude again for you being willing to join us today and for really reviewing this very impressive research that has expanded and grown in so many ways over the years. And you're really a shining star doing this incredible work. So I'm so appreciative. Thank you very much. Um, let me say that um, before we wrap up today, we are, we of course have Indigenous health and well-being 
a colloquium speakers every so often in our departmental seminar. And the next one's coming up on February 22nd when we'll feature uh, Professor Stephanie Russo Carroll from the University of Arizona who will talk to us about data sovereignty issues when it comes to indigenous community research. Um, and Amy, actually, there was a question about that that I didn't have time to ask you about too that people were asking. So it's on people's mind, which is important. So um, thanks again. And uh, Scott, I'll give the floor back to you. No, thank you, Dr. Bombay. Thank you, Dr. Gan, for allowing us to co our Department of Global Health and Social Medicine to co-host this with the our University Native American program. Uh, really grateful to, to, to both of you. And uh, for anyone who's following our seminar series um, this month as well, next week, uh, Wednesday at noon, we'll be hosting Jeremy Green, who's the chair of the history of medicine at Johns Hopkins University, who will be speaking on the doctor who wasn't there, really the history of medicine at a distance from the 19th century and the telephone to televisits. Uh, today. So it should be a fascinating talk. Um, hopefully as, as good as today's. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you again, Amy. It was great.